Okay. So I'm Adam Kellogg. I'm the residency director uh, here at UMass Bay State. I've got three of our fourth of our four chief residents with us tonight as well to also answer your questions, tell you all about the program. What we thought we would do is we would give sort of a quick overview. It's going to be like a miniature version of the talk I give on interview day that sort of tells you about the program. I'm going to do sort of the super compressed five, seven minute version of it. They just, you know, kind of just some baseline things just to hopefully head off some questions so that when we get to the question part, which is going to be most of what we're going to do, when we get to the questions, we can get right down to like the good stuff, the stuff that you really want to know uh, and, and kind of learn about our program tonight. Um, we'll, uh, so I will throw it to the chiefs afterwards uh, with some opening questions for them. I'm going to ask them uh, why they came here and a uh, little something about what they wish they had known when they were in your shoes. I'm giving them a little bit of time to figure that out. And then we're going to make it much more free form after that so you can get what you want known, uh, what questions you want answered. We'll be watching the chat. Um, and so feel free to put questions in there too. But also unmute, jump in. We're going to hopefully make this really conversational as we go. So, all right, I'm going to throw up a few slides and we'll go through those real quick just because I think it's helpful to have a little bit of visual aid. Just want to set it so I can see everybody, then I can find out who falls asleep. And it's going to be Jules. She worked the overnight last night. Okay. So this is Bay State Medical Center. This is like the helicopter view for the publicity pictures. It's all of these different buildings on this campus. It's probably five hospitals built at different times that have all kind of grown together. It is a big place. It's a 700 plus bed hospital. Peak of COVID, we had about 800 beds, but that's converting like the day surgical center pack you over here into uh, into inpatient beds for that too. We probably run a little under 700 most of the time. It's a tertiary referral center, the only one in the area, meaning that we are the level one trauma, the primary cath center, the primary brain cath stroke center, the only place a kid can get admitted for a good long while in every direction because we've got the only PICU in the region. Um, where is Bay State? If you were thinking this was like San Francisco Bay and you were, uh, I have bad news for you, it's named after Cape Cod Bay, even though we are on the other side of the state, almost two hours from Ocean, a couple hours from Boston, out here, um, almost into Southern Connecticut or into Northern Connecticut. Um, we are the only hospital for this is sort of, you know, you have places like Boston where there are multiple hospitals on top of each other. We are the only residency, the only teaching center in the area. And so everything that's sort of within this big circle, those are all, we are the, you know, the, that's our catchment area. Anybody gets sick, something goes wrong, they end up with us, even if they stop at one of the smaller community hospitals in between. And there's something like a million people or so in that area going all the way to New York State, down into Connecticut, part way towards Worcester, Massachusetts, and then up into New Hampshire, even New Hampshire, Southern Vermont, we get patients sent down from there as well. So it's a lot of people for one center. Um, this is what our hospital looks like uh, during interview season when, you know, the days are only about eight hours long, though, really got to throw a couple more ambulances in. That's more like it. Um, our ED is about 10 years old, maybe a little bit more at this point, but it's a relatively new facility. It's the entire ground floor of this building, which is pretty enormous. It's like three football fields in length and is made up of four big acute care pods. We had about 100 plus rooms. And that's defined, that's 95 technically, which is like a room with a door, but we squeeze in another 60, 70 folks into various improvised spaces, even more than that sometimes. Um, we see about 110,000 visits of which two thirds are adult and, a, and one third of that is pediatrics having the only, we have an embedded pediatric ED, dedicated PDED within our emergency department. So that's about a third of our visits. We see the most penetrating trauma of any hospital in Massachusetts, but we see way more blunt trauma then we do penetrating trauma. And we uh, were the highest acuity academic ED before COVID. COVID has sort of wreaked havoc with those numbers. But what that means is um, you're gonna see a lot of sick people training here. But this graph represents what's something called emergency severity index, which is a measure of like, when you hit the door, how sick are you? It's like a triage, how sick are you scale? So an ESI one is the sickest of the sick. This is cardiac arrest, STEMI, code, septic shock, like the sickest folks. ESI 2 is people who should be seen right now, people who should be in a bed being seen by, by a provider right now. They're hypoxic, they're septic, they're sick, but they're not quite as sick as the ESI 1s. Bay State's the dark blue bar and the 75th percentile of academic EDs, meaning EDs with a residency, is the dark green. So 
our patient population that we see is heavily shifted into the acuity end of it. So when you hear about base state, you're going to hear about lots of volume, lots of acuity, which is going to get you all the training that you need to be able to go be a practicing emergency physician in any setting. And if you don't believe me, the chiefs, you know, after I log off and leave you the chiefs, they can tell you if it's actually busy at all. Um, how do we counteract that? How do we make it functional to do that? It starts with sane scheduling. You know, we have a big wellness philosophy here, but it's not based on like, you know, essential oil misters and a safe full of candy that we do have a safe full of candy in the ED. It's really about the things that make a fundamental difference in whether you're going to be well and during your training or able to find your way back to sort of that balance. Um, and the schedule is the first place it starts. We do nine hour shifts with an hour. It's eight hours of actively picking up patients and an hour overlap period in there. Um, that comes out to, as an intern, still to 45 hours per week in the ED, which if you think, oh, that sounds pretty good, that's because you've been brainwashed by medicine into thinking that 45 hours is a good schedule, when really that's what's called overtime in like any other industry or profession. We have a culture of sign-out, which is probably the more important than our nine-hour shifts, because uh, you will give sign-outs to your colleagues, you will take their sign-outs so they can go home, you can get back to the other things in your life. And that's how you keep nine from turning into 11, 12, 13, because you're not allowed to hand off your patient. So it's really important to us that you're able to hand patients off and go home. When Jules left her shift this morning, she could hand off her patients and get out of there, hopefully pretty quickly. Um, and then we backload your ED time. We give you sort of that cross-training, that off-service time, the time where you pretend to be a cardiologist or pretend to be a traumatologist. You do that early, and then you have long stretches later on in the ED doing the things that you really like, which the seniors, like our chiefs, really enjoy. And the interns are sort of really, really happy for those stretches. They get to come back to the ED, but they always wish they had more ED time. It's very much a team-based setup. We have four provider teams. So one of those is pediatrics. And then we have two adult teaching teams, which is an attending, a, a third year resident, a second year resident, and then usually an intern as part of that team. Um, and you do everything together. We go to resuscitations together with pre-assigned roles. The third year is going to run it. The second year is going to do the airway. That intern is going to be there helping out with access, helping out with the ultrasound, getting experience, getting to see how to run a resuscitation, learning how to do it before they move into those roles as the airway person. And then eventually as the person running all of those resuscitations. And then as the attending, I get to like stand in the corner, leaning on the sharps container and, you know, just, you know, picking on people. Maybe they let me touch the ultrasound once in a while, but not that often. We all come together as a team uh, at that sign out at that change of shift time, halfway through that sign out hour, we all come together. And as a team, the outgoing team signs out to the incoming team. So we all do our shifts together. We don't really do a lot of waterfall kind of scheduling with the residents. You come in as a team, you leave as a team. When we do need to cover those change of shifts, when we do need to deal with things like uh, inpatient boarding and how do we address that and how do we get people seen even though the, how, the place is really full, we address that by adding in extra shifts, uh, specifically for our attendings to work as providers in triage, seeing the patients up front and trying to divert them into a, a lower acuity area. Um, but away from where the residents are taking care of patients and getting those undifferentiated sick patients. We cover those changes shifts with flex team. And as the residents, you'll do some time as the flex team as well, but that uh, lets you kind of check it, try out different, you know, kind of covering the whole department and helping out in different places. But that helps kind of make it so that resus that comes in in the middle of, uh, of sign out doesn't completely derail the sign out and keep everybody there. Unless four recesses come in at the same time, in which case, you know, that's a once in a while thing, but it does happen. Philosophically, the way we're going to teach you emergency medicine is you're going to learn it from emergency physicians. It's a big, busy place, but we are not a traditional university hospital. We don't have all the different residencies. We've got like the core third year rotation ones, but we don't have ortho trainees. We don't have ENT trainees. There's no neurology residency, which means that most of our consultants, we have to be a level one trauma center. We have to have all those consultants for backup, but our consultants want us to do as much as we possibly can. The ENTs want us to drain the peritonsillar abscesses. The ortho, ortho folks want us to do as much as we possibly can without them. We've got them for backup, but we get to do those things and you get to do it throughout your training, um, which is, makes it a longitudinal experience. Very few things are one month to learn everything where it's a concentrated experience and then that's it. Most things are you're going to see them and do them throughout your training. Pediatrics being a good example of this, you'll do some concentrated PD time early, 
And then you'll do PD shifts every month through the rest of your training. You'll respond to PD recesses when you're up front in the adult pods, but you'll get lots and lots of pediatric exposure so that you feel really comfortable with kids because kids are scary. Okay, sick kids are scary. Well, kids are fine. Um, and like I said, we front load the off service time. And then one of the goals we have is we want you to find balance in residency, start to work on getting your kind of your true north, figuring out where, where are you balanced and how do you get back there? And, you know, sometimes you will be out of balance, especially on some of those really intensive rotations like trauma and ICU, but knowing where you want to be and sort of working your way back and what things you need to do for yourself so that you can get there. As an intern, these are sort of the core rotations we have you do, um, ICU, cardiac ICU, trauma, couple weeks on inpatient peds, a couple weeks of OBGYN and three weeks anesthesia. Everything else is ED based. Uh, our July month is a full orientation month just in the ED, just getting to know the system and bonding with your 15 new best friends. You do 17 weeks combined in the adult and pediatric ED. You do uh, a month on ultrasound and a couple of weeks on EMS. Then when you're a second year, you get nine months in the ED. So you've kind of front loaded a lot of that off service time, nine months in the ED, one month as a senior in the pediatric ICU, one month as a senior in the surgical ICU, and then a full four-week elective in there as well. And then as a third year, 10 months in the ED, another month spread at our different community, trying out our different community sites, and then a month of elective. We have a whole bunch of fellowships here. As you guys are kind of touring around, you'll often see that different places, um, when they have an area they feel like they have a lot to offer in, they start a fellowship. We started a medical education fellowship for that reason, and now we've got nine different fellowships with that 10th spot I'm kind of saving for global health. I think hopefully in the next few years, we'll get that back off the ground. But we've got, uh, you know, these are all areas that we think we're pretty strong. When you look, you'll see like toxicology is not there. I think, you know, you'll see lots of toxicology patients, but that's an area where this is not, we're not going to be giving you that type of, you know, formal toxicology experience you would get at a place that is part of a poison center. And as you look at different programs, you want to weigh those things. You're going to see, you know, we're going to put for our best foot forward and show you the stuff that we're really good at. And, you know, other programs are going to do the same thing. And so you have to figure out kind of what priorities matter for you. All right. In terms of how many residents we have, important question. So it's a three-year residency. I probably should have led with that. 16 residents per year. We have about 10 to 12 of the various EM fellows per year, and then three or four pediatric EM fellows as well. And then these are the chiefs that I'm going to throw it to. This is uh, Colleen Bannigan, Julianne Earle, and Colton Conrad. And then the gentleman who's uh, a little deficient on hair is Dean Cataldo. He's working tonight. Um, so I'm going to shut down the screen share. I promise that's it for PowerPoints for the evening, unless the chiefs have a hidden PowerPoint I don't know about. Um, but would you guys mind kind of introducing yourself and then sharing with uh, with our folks who are joining us tonight kind of why you came to Bay State and then what do you wish you had known when you were in their shoes? I, okay. Who is the who's the most uh, acute academic ED now? You said we were the most acute. Did that get stolen from us? So the title is really hard to figure out right now because it's wherever the COVID surge is the worst, like the unvac. So all the unvaccinated states or lower vaccination level areas kind of had it, but it, uh, I have not seen them be able to kind of collect clean data. So 2019 was the last time they were able to sort of put the data together. We had the belt then. Um, I don't know who technically has it right now. It's probably Florida. But the ED has not changed. It is the same high acuity, high volume place that sort of uh, that got us into that predicament. Well, since I interrupted the flow, I'm Colton. I'm one of the chiefs. I drank the Bay State Kool Aid a long time ago. I uh, I went to med school at UMass. I'm not from Massachusetts, uh, but I fell in love with this state. Uh, when I went to med school here, uh, fell in love with a chick from South Boston who's also a doctor, and then we both fell in love with Bay State when we were doing our rotations. Um, I knew I wanted to do emergency medicine from the time I was like 19 years old, and I worked as a PCT in an emergency department back home in North Carolina, and it was like a very rural critical access hospital. And I just remember thinking, man, it would be really cool if I could find a place where everyone is this nice to each other. And uh, when I came up here, I was just terrified because uh, all I had heard about people from New England my entire life is that they were all really mean. 
And then when I was at UMass, the main campus, and I rotated through their ED, I was like, man, everyone's kind of mean. Uh, and then I rotated out through Bay State, and I was like, wow, people aren't mean out here. This is weird. Uh, I feel, felt like I was being tricked for like the first little while, but I did all of my core third year clinical rotations out here and didn't have a bad experience on really any rotation. And I was like, well, that that bodes well for this hospital. And then I did my uh, my my core EM rotation out here. I actually did three of them. I did like my, I, I did an ultrasound rotation. I did a core EM rotation. And then I did my audition rotation out here. And for like those three months that I was in the CD, I felt like everyone was so nice. And that's when I got really sold on the place. Um, so that's why I ended up here. I'm. Can we come back to what I wish I had known? Okay. I can go next in the meantime. I'll come up with it. Think about your answer. I can go I'll next. I'll come up with something. Um, Adam called me by my government name. I'm Julianne. That's what you'll see on websites and stuff like that. People call me Jules. Um, I'm one of the chiefs. I'm one of the threes. Uh, I'm born and raised in Massachusetts. <laughs> Oh, don't spell it like that, please. Um, born and raised in Massachusetts uh, on the other side of the state in Fall River. Uh, I went to school in New York and I was a COVID kid. Um, so I didn't get the chance, unfortunately, to rotate at Bay State like a lot of other folks did. Um, so my experience was a lot of over Zoom. Um, and as you guys can imagine, that was, I, I think it's different now because you guys have the opportunity to audition and stuff. Um, it was harder for us to get a grip on like what a program was truly like. Um, but with all of the different kind of opportunities that we had with Zoom, I felt like Bay States was the most unique and that we had game nights so I could actually see what the residents were like. Um, and I want to know that they were normal. Like uh, Adam kind of says this sometimes during interviews and stuff, like we want the people that we're gonna work with at 3 a.m. Like, are you normal? Are you chill? Like, can we get along? Are you a good person? Um, and I wanted to know that I fit with people that were like-minded like me that were, you know, interested in similar things and that, you know, the beauty of having a program that's bigger with 16 people per class is that you're going to find people that you like. And this program is unique, I think, in that our classes get really close really fast. And Adam doesn't exaggerate when he says you're going to be meeting your 15 closest friends in your first month. Um, that's why you have such a great orientation month. And that was also really appealing for me. Um, and I really wanted to be in Massachusetts because like Colton said, uh, <laughs> people here are a lot nicer. Um, in New York, people were not as friendly. I'm sorry if anyone's from New York. Um, but it was just different. It was more like coming home for me. And that was a goal. And it's felt like home since I've been here. So um, that's been really great for me. And I, I'm lucky to be here. Uh, in terms of things that I wish I knew, I think I wish I had known to ask more about like culture with sign out. Because um, I didn't realize what a luxury it is to be here where you can sign just about anything out and be done with your patients at the time of sign out. Um, I don't know if other programs are similar in that nature because I didn't know to ask about that. Um, but that's something I would encourage you to ask about because it tells you a lot about how much of the program values your well-being and you getting out on time. Um, so it'll speak volumes. But for us, it's really special and it's I, I really appreciate it. All right, I'm Colleen, um, another chief. Um, I So a couple of things. Colton and Jules kind of hit everything that I wanted to talk about. So thank you two for doing that. Um, but... So I'm from Virginia. Um, I, my mom was from Massachusetts. I've grown up coming up to New England. So I knew I wanted to be in this area for residency. Um, like Jules said, it was tough to kind of get a culture from a Zoom session. And I agree that that my interview night, it was my last interview of the season. Um, it was then that I was like, you know what, these are kind of people that I would like to hang out with on a daily basis. And that was important to me because, again, you're going to be spending almost all your time with your co-residents. So I wanted people like minded kind of have similar um, interests as well. Um, with regards to the actual program itself, for me, what was important was good peds exposure, because uh, like Adam said, there's nothing worse than dealing with a sick kid. Um, and I can confidently say as now a third year that I've seen a ton of really sick pediatric patients and definitely um, feel more comfortable dealing with them. Um, also, I think, like he said, acuity wise, um, this is top notch. And I wanted to train at a place that I got to do everything. Um, I don't necessarily see 
myself being at like an academic site in the long term potentially. Um, but Colton, close your ears. He's going to be mad at me for saying this, but like I've done four pericardiocentesis over the last couple of months. I did a lateral canthotomy the other, like a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's been just like a lot of acuity over the last couple of weeks. So, or last month or so. So I think from that standpoint, our training is, is pretty, pretty amazing here. Um, what I didn't know about Bay State, let's see. Well, one, how nice everyone was. Again, I would like my mom and I would joke around about mass holes and stuff. And I thought that that was potentially going to be the case. Uh, far from it, at least at Bay State. Um, I, yes, Colton's right. I am a neglectful practitioner. I actually um, like dissected my patient so that I could do a pericardiocentesis. No. Um, and then another thing that I had no idea was that you could be on call during residency. I didn't ask a single question about that throughout. And I think one thing that surprised me was that by being on call and getting called in, we actually get paid for that shift, um, which comes out to about like $500 or so. Um, so I think that's something, you know, to ask other programs, like if you're on call, do you get paid uh, for coming into that shift? Because I think that that's a nice, um, a nice thing to have that I had no idea about. And, and I agree with the sign out culture as well. I didn't, didn't even know what sign out was to be honest until I came here. And then I was like, Oh, this is nice that we don't have to like carry our patients throughout, you know, until they get dispoed. Um, so I think that that's great. The only thing we can't sign out are, uh, fecal disimpactions. That's like the one procedure we absolutely are not allowed to sign out. And if you do, you will never hear the end of it. I'm sorry, Dr. Vanigan, did you not do that recently? No, no. Mm. No, Matt Seno almost did. I may or may not have signed one out to him. So go be as is big. But full circle. Um, let's see. Adam, do you have anything else before we kick you off? Um, I was going to ask one more question of you three. So what are you doing next? Like, at, what's your life after Bay State look like? And, you know, how did you come to that decision? I also thought of what I would, that that I want to tell people, like what I wish I had known. Um, I think the big thing that people get into is looking for places that have like a brand name or a lot of prestige behind them. And what I will tell you is that as an institution, we don't always choose the best people, we choose the right people. And there's such a wide mix of people at our program, and it's incredible how well we vibe out together. Like, I went to a community college because I almost failed out of high school and then went to a small state school in eastern Tennessee, and then ended up in Massachusetts by accident. And like, didn't have great board scores, um, but I love my job and I'm like, I don't know, I feel like I'm getting better every day. But some of my colleagues are like absolute geniuses and like the smartest people that I've ever met. And if you put us, you know, side by side in like traditional metrics, I don't think that it would have even been a competition about who gets into like a normal residency. Uh, Cause I just, I don't know if I stack up. So uh, the thing that I'll say is you know, if you need to end up at a tier one place, if you need to have colleagues that all scored like 260s on step one and step two or whatever, like those places exist. But what I would focus on is our places where residents tell you that the culture is good and they tell you that their training is good and they tell you that they get along with their colleagues. Because a lot of the places that I interviewed that were T1 research and super duper prestigious. The first thing people talked to me about was uh, how they couldn't wait to get out of residency. And they were always telling me about like, hey, you know, I love this place because it's it's really near all of these spots that I can go that aren't the hospital. Uh, and at the end of the day, like it's great to be out of the hospital, but when you're there, you have to like it too, because you're going to be there a lot, no matter where you end up. So I love going and playing outside and I love that I am near the mountains because I grew up in the mountains, but I also love going to work most of the time. So I think just keep an eye out for that. 
with that said, I am applying to fellowship right now. I wanted to do wilderness medicine for a long time, uh, but was recently convinced to maybe go into wilderness by way of an EMS fellowship. And I'm going to try and stay here. So I don't know if I'll maybe see Hi. some of you guys next year. Yeah, I just submitted my application the other day. Thanks for updating me. I didn't have time because I was too busy crafting the most gorgeous personal statement any of you have ever read. So I forgot about everything. I don't think I used the same adjective more than once. It's, I didn't even have to make up adjectives like rolled doll. They were all real ones. Um, so I am currently applying for a sports medicine fellowship. Um, it's one of the fellowships that we do not have here at Bay State. Um, I think coming in, I always wanted to do sports medicine. I picked another reason why I picked Bay State is that we don't have an orthopedic residency. So I've been able to do a lot of my own reductions and fracture care and stuff like that, which I think is a huge um, benefit. Uh, coming into training. So I, right now, I'm currently in Boston uh, doing a sports medicine away rotation at um, Boston Medical Center. Uh, so I'm covering BU sports um, and BC football. Um, so that is where I'm at now um, and applying all over. I've been getting some good interviews. So, I, you know, I don't think just because Bay State doesn't have, you know, a fellowship that, um, you know, that you're interested in doesn't mean that it puts you at a disadvantage uh, going into something that we might not have. Um, for me, I was kind of in a toss up for a little bit between EMS and teaching just, well, med ed, excuse me, um, just because I've been kind of, I've noticed the overlap in the two of them for a long time. And it took me a while to kind of tease out what I actually wanted. And I think I realized pretty, after like a few conversations with a lot of different people that med ed was better for me just because even before I did medicine, that was my first love was teaching and I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher for a really long time. Um, but basically it has given us lots of opportunities to teach, which has kind of also helped me tease that out. And it's something that I, I enjoy and I get a lot out of. So we get a lot of time with you guys, like medical students, when you can rotate with us, um, with ultrasound and stuff like that. We do a lot of workshops, um, which I really love. So, I mean, if I play my cards right and things fall where they may, maybe I will stay at base eight. <laughs> I also, obviously you guys have noticed all three of us are interested in fellowship. I think that's one of the reasons why we uh, went for chief, um, just because uh, we enjoy uh, kind of this aspect of things. However, that doesn't mean that we all go into fellowship from our class. Uh, we're, I think there's probably four people um, that are doing fellowships. Otherwise, everybody else is planning on doing community medicine. So you just happen to have the people that are interested in fellowships, but that is not, um, that's not the majority, at least for our class. So yeah, in years past, it seems like it's been like more of a 50 50 split with fellowships and stuff. If you look at the so if you look at the base stadium Instagram, if you scroll down, there's like other years when we congratulate our people that have matched fellowships. And you'll see that it's like half of a class at a time. Um, our class is one of the first ones that's doing more community heavy. Um, but again, you have opportunities to do whatever you want. You have opportunities to rotate at our community sites, figure out what you like, what you want. Um, lots of exposures. And I also think um, with regards to our elective rotations, that's a good time to kind of tease out potential fellowships that you may want to do. So um, last year, um, we have the opportunity to do either a month long uh, elective or a longitudinal elective where we can um, get a shift reduction every month to then go do something else. Um, so last year I did mine in sports medicine. So it allowed me to go to the sports medicine conference for about four days um, I was one of the team physicians for the um, Springfield Thunderbirds, which is our local AHL um, affiliate team, um, and then was able to kind of attend uh, online like lecture series through uh, the sports medicine like um, society. So um, that provided me a good opportunity where now this year I'm doing a month long elective with a uh, sports med crew. Um, so we definitely have opportunities to get exposure, whether that's maybe you do two weeks in med ed and two weeks in EMS to see if that's what something you're interested in. It's super flexible with regards to our elective time. All right, what questions can this group answer for you guys? 
Uh, feel free to put them in the chat, unmute, share them with you. Uh, I will hang around so long as there's questions for me. If you've got individual questions you don't want to throw out there, I put my email uh, in the chat a little while ago. Feel, like, don't hesitate. Please reach out. I'm happy to answer questions, whether they're general advice, you know, general application questions, base state specific questions. It's all fine by me. So if you guys have some questions, otherwise, once you run out of questions uh, that I might have an answer to and you want to get the real truth from the Chiefs, I'm going to dip out of here. Hello. Uh, can you guys hear me? Awesome. Um, how do you guys handle your psych patients in the ED? Do you guys the social workers, crisis workers, anything like that? Yeah, so um, we, so that's actually been a transition since um, our group has come to uh, residency. Um, initially, we had what we call our behavioral health network, so BHN. Um, we had on site in within our emergency department, um, and they were dealing with a lot of um, the dispositions for our psych patients and whatnot. Um, we have act because of this a new state rule it's um the responsibility of the hospital systems now to provide um behavioral health assessments and uh, treatment so um we have now hired a lot of those same bhn workers within bay state um and it's actually been a super streamlined process and to be honest it, this uh the current process that we have is much better so we will initially see the patient we will medically clear them. And once medically cleared, refer them to our behavioral health team. Uh, they'll then assess them and determine uh, their disposition from there. Um, we have pretty great relationships with these um, uh, crisis workers. Um, and we have also a um, really well known in the emergency medicine field, Bill Soares, who's um, in charge of a lot of um, the opiate use disorder, alcohol use disorder research. Um, so we are initiating, you know, Suboxone and Methadone within our emergency department as well. Um, so we have a lot of good resources with regards to that. We also have recovery coaches in our ED that can help uh, some of these patients find detoxes and whatnot. So I think from that standpoint, um, I've been super happy with our behavioral health um, kind of process at Bay State. It's actually like really refreshing, uh, even though there's still kinks within the, the mental health system. I, I think that's just uh, representative of a, a larger national issue. But where I was a PCT back in Tennessee, 10 care, which is uh, the, the state uh, Medicare Medicaid services. Uh, if, if a psych patient showed up to the ED and warranted an inpatient psychiatric admission, the 10 care program would pay for 72 hours, and if they couldn't come up with money for their medications or to stay longer after 72 hours, they would just get sent out. And so there was just this constant cycle of people would get admitted to a psych facility, get kicked out, not be given a ride, find a way back to the ED, and then just do the same thing. And they just lived in this limbo of occasionally having the medications they need for the 72 hours they were in a psych facility and then being discharged and waiting for up to like 96 to 120 hours in our ED for another bed to open. Um, so even though there's still gaps, it's kind of amazing for me as someone totally outside of this sphere of like decent access to healthcare to say, hey, I think this person needs to go into a hospital setting. And someone says, yeah, absolutely. And then I check their note a few weeks later and a psychiatrist is seeing them and arranging outpatient follow-up. And like, it's not even a question that they have equitable and appropriate access. So it's kind of amazing. I don't know how many fellow Southerners we have in here, but the access to mental health care above the Mason-Dixon line, particularly in Massachusetts, has kind of just blown my mind. I was wondering if I can ask you guys a question. Um, I was wondering how you guys kind of um, deal with having applicants or uh, new interns that start with families or with significant others who are not from the area and don't really have connections to Massachusetts. Do you guys have like support groups or some sort of like, do you normally have um, partners come with during these retreats or how does that usually work for you guys? Um, first of all, we don't accept people with significant others. You're not allowed here. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, of course, you're allowed here. Of course, we love to meet your partners and significant others. Like, I think one thing that's really special about Bay State is like we love meeting people's families. <laughs> chill out. <laughs> if that was true, I'd have to leave. Um, so I think we love meeting other people's families, kids, like it's the Bay State family is very strong. And I know people that's like so cliche and so cheese to say, but it is really true. We do want to meet your people um, and get to know you fully. But in terms of support groups, I think you'll find that a lot of people, we do have different dynamics that exist within our residency. Like some people are dating somebody, some people are engaged, some people have kids, some people are just married with no kids. And um, I think you'll find people that uh, have similar lifestyles um, and you can find support in them. I think that's probably the best way to say that. Um, but it, again, in terms of like having your people join you, like we love seeing them. Uh, we love meeting them and spending time. So like, you're welcome to bring them to anything that we have. But that being said, retreat is a little bit different. That is like our protected time. So that way you bond with your class. Um, so that way you get to know the people that you're going to be working with for the next three years. Um, Cause those are the people in your corner. So that's like a, like a more closed off, um, opportunity to meet people but i think otherwise we encourage you to bring them yeah your class will adopt your children your pets your significant other the whole residency will i don't know if anybody spends money on like a kennel if they travel i think they just drop their dogs off with somebody else and just have a puppy party yeah and also if you're um you know, interested in maybe starting a family in uh, residency, um, we have changed a lot of our um, scheduling. So um, basically, um, studies have shown that females um, have a higher risk of um, miscarriages during their first and third trimesters, um, specifically regarding uh, working nights. Um, and so we, if we find out that uh, one of our co-residents is pregnant, um, we will take them off all their night shifts in that first and third trimester um, and rearrange the schedule so that, you know, we can uh, support support them. Um, so, you know, just little things like that, that you might not think of at a residency. Um, I think, you know, we do, you know, emphasize wellness. And those are kind of some of the objective things that we do to really make sure that our residents are well. How would you describe your patient population? Um, do you have a lot of uninsured, maybe low SES patients that you're seeing? that maybe don't have the best access to care? I would say sick is my best way to describe the patient population. That's my first word that came to mind when you asked that. But I think we do have like kind of like a spectrum of people. I will say that we are maybe leaning more towards um, the low socioeconomic status side of things and less um, healthcare literacy, um, less follow-up. There's a large undomiciled population. Um, so I think that's a lot of the reason why with a poor access to care, they'll come in a lot sicker than in other places. Um, Cause obviously the health, cost of healthcare is ridiculous right now. Um, and a lot of times that is unaffordable for people. So they just don't have it and then they don't follow up and then they get sick. Um, so that's been my experience. That's kind of what I've noticed, but we do definitely have a spectrum. Yeah, we have a huge yeah. Spanish speaking population. It's uh, over a quarter of our patients are primarily Spanish speaking or first language Spanish speaking. We have interpreter 24-7 uh, essentially assigned to the ED to come help us. If you have language skills, they come in really handy. We've got the little iPad interpreters everywhere uh, as well, which became really popular in the pandemic. About 15% of our patient population is Black. Uh, we have a large Vietnamese population here. We have a large first generation Russian population here. Uh, we have, um, it, uh, we've got a Nepalese refugee population. It is, uh, it's a much more diverse than you would imagine. Sort of, if you think of like Western Massachusetts where people go leaf peeping and it's a much more diverse area. Um, but not, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not Queens, it's not New York city. It's not, you know, it's not Boston, but it's, it's a fairly diverse area. And then also socioeconomically, we have where the referral center for the where you get your fancy cancer treatment, where you get your aorta replaced and get your brain cath. And a lot of that subsidizes being the safety net hospital because there is no Springfield City Hospital. There is no Hamden County Hospital that sort of is the safety net hospital. It is us. We are the safety net hospital for the for the region as well. So sort of both serving both of those missions. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, um, thanks for doing this, guys. Um, 
I guess, Colleen, it sounded like you were pretty like set on sports med, like from the get go, I guess, like for your classmates who are a little bit more like not exactly sure, but wanting to explore the subspecialties, do you feel like Bay State set you up for success in being able to use that elective time to explore things you might be interested in? And did you feel like the faculty were receptive if you did find an interest and you wanted to explore that? Do you feel like um, like that was like fostered as far as wanting to see what was out there? Yeah, I I think um, being at a program that's so large, we have, you know, one, a ton of faculty that have so many different interests. So I think, um, you know, being able to play off of them uh, is super helpful when trying to decide, you know, kind of a future in emergency medicine. Um, I think then also because of our, you know, residency being so large, there's a lot of people outside of just Bay State um, working in the hospital that if you say like, you know, like for instance, I have, I had a, you know, a sports medicine interest. Well, then I got so many different attendings being like, oh, I know this person who, you know, is in sports medicine, or I know this person who did global health and has a clinic and like a group of uh, two of our residents just went to Rwanda um, to do global health stuff. So like, we have such a large network that I think, um, you know, it would be very difficult to like not determine what you wanted to do if that was something that you're interested in pursuing as a fellowship later on. And like I said, the elective portion of the time, you it's really whatever you make of it. So um, so if that means doing a week in different, you know, type of specialties to figure that out, um, we are in full support of that as well. I just wanted to say good night. I'm going to step away. I'm going to go tuck one of my kids in. But also, I think we're definitely that was that pivot point to the I want them to give real answers to your questions without uh, without dad listening. So uh, I'm going to leave and then they can tell you if uh, there's any, they want to add anything to your question. But it was great to meet all of you. Thank you for taking the time to come meet us tonight. I hope you get all the things you need to know answered um, and have a wonderful and good luck with the application process. It's going to go great. It's going to go fine. And I hope to see you all in the future. Take care. Hi, Adam. Does this stop recording, by the way? Or does it keep going? Okay, just making sure. Oh, can they see the chat? <laughs> oh, can't wait for this to go on the website. That's amazing. All right, guys, hit us. What you got? You can also kind of do whatever you want with a rotation. It doesn't even necessarily have to be within an EM specialty. So like I'm doing an EMS rotation coming up. Um, I have four total weeks to do whatever I want with it. But one of the things that I'm kind of passionate about is uh, kidney disease. So I'm literally doing a week on the nephrology service out of my four weeks. So I'm going to do like little baby intro to nephrology and try and get them to convince me that contrast induced nephropathy is a real thing and then make my way downstairs to go learn how to drive an ambulance. So you kind of can choose your own adventure. Are you just going on dates with Costas? Is that what you're doing? Or yeah, or Spencer, like literally anyone. They're all yeah, so hot. It doesn't matter. I'll hang out with any of them. You just have a crush on all of them. I'm going to get, dude, yeah, I, I do. I'm going to get a suit jacket so I can match the boys upstairs. It's going to be so sick. Make sure you get a Yale lanyard too so you match Costas. So cute. I'm going to get a Harvard lanyard. Ooh. Guys, stop talking. Okay. I just want to the didactic. Um, time framework or like what kind of protected time do you guys get? The question is about didactic time. Sorry, I couldn't hear you too well. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so like what kind of protected time do you guys get? Is it like the night before as well or just the didactic time itself? So we've reviewed our conference policy extensively uh, in the last year or so. You have protected time for conference every week from 10 to 2.33 o'clock. Um, that is every week that is your protected time away from a rotation. You will not be scheduled to work that shift. Um, in terms of coming in later or doing the first half of conference virtually, if you're working three to midnight the day before and the day of conference, then you are excused for coming in person. And you can zoom in for the first half. I don't know how long that'll be happening, unfortunately, just because of the changing regulations with ACGME. And now that things are not as virtual heavy um, as COVID is fluctuating. Um, but in terms of attendance, you're required to go to 70% of uh, all of the conference and academic or commitments. 
Um, that includes War Club, which is our now called Resiliency Conference, which is basically like a, a journal club or a space where we discuss relevant topics to residency outside of even traditional academic teaching. Like instead of talking about something like DKA, we'll talk about the job search. We'll talk about burnout. Um, we'll talk about staying well in residency. And typically it's a space that's outside of the hospital. Um, and that is also considered your conference attendance, which is also protected time. Um, that'll be once a month on a Thursday. Um, and you are excused from your clinical duties for that as well. Like whether you're off service or in the department, you won't be working. Um, and then in terms of like vacation and stuff too, if you're on vacation, you're not expected to go to conference. Same thing with overnights. Like I'm on nights right now. They had a conference today. I obviously didn't go because I needed to sleep for my own mental health. Yeah, and we'll fight off service people if they keep you any longer than you need to. So um, it is protected time. They cannot keep you in their, you know, CCU, ICU, whatever. Um, you have to leave by 955. Um, obviously, you know, little things come up here and there, but like we we want our residents at didactic. So if that means like Adam literally has called one of the attendings to be like, let our resident leave. Um, or us as chiefs will yell at a, another chief being like, this is unacceptable. So uh, we take our didactic time and protected time very seriously here. Um, and then that's the same with uh, Resilience Club as well. Like if a trauma team is keeping you there till 530, like anything past that, I'm on the phone with whoever and yelling at them to let our resident leave. So. I do like to yell. I was a goalkeeper. It's part of my job. The other part of that is um, when you are in conference, you are not to be doing, you're not answering a pager. That's like a big red flag. Like we do not expect you to do anything clinical during your conference protected time. Um, even though you are technically off service in the trauma service, you don't answer your pager. You defer all of those calls to the trauma team because they are still actively taking care of patients. You are in education time. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Anna. Thank you for making yourselves available um, to answer our stuff. Um, I wanted to ask, so are traumas run by the emergency team um, or do you guys do like one of those, like the alternative days and things like that? ED runs traumas on the even day, E and E, all right? Uh, and it's a hard cut off at midnight. So if it's the even day and there's a trauma alert at 1159, that's yours. If it's 1201 on an odd day, it's theirs. Um, and it so we so we flip flop days between running and then doing procedures. So you don't really shy away from getting procedures in the trauma bay either. And you get plenty of experience running them, which you'll be really good at by the time you become a third year EM resident. Because it's kind of just like a more uh disheveled like cardiac arrest type thing like if you're running a big crazy trauma people are just a lot louder in there but you're already going to know how to control room so it's going to be super sick um the only thing that i don't think we get hands on with unless the unless the surgical residents aren't there it are thor economies um when adam was doing residency here 100 years ago he said that EM residents got to do a lot more thoracotomies just because people were doing them more often. Um, but ever since ATLS guidelines changed to be, you know, don't even really bother continuing a resuscitation in a penetrating trauma to the chest unless you have witness cardiac arrest for less than 15 minutes. We, they're not, you know, surgeons aren't even really getting to do as many because they've realized you're brutalizing people's corpse. Uh, so because, because the opportunities not there as much as it used to be, we prioritize letting the surgical residents do it. But that doesn't mean that we don't see a bunch of them. I just, you know, I don't think it's generally us getting to do them. But you might get to like crank the little thing. And then, how to aorta. Yeah. and then as a second year ED resident, you are responsible for all airways um, in trauma. So that's always gonna be a second year ED resident at the head of the bed doing uh, the airway assessment and then calculating the GCS, which is by far the most stressful thing you'll ever have to do in residency. Um, but yeah, so there's always at least two ED providers and then an at ED attending is always in a trauma as well on top of the surgery team and then the surgical um, attending, uh, trauma attending. So uh, usually it's a pretty packed room. We have three trauma bays. 
Um, one's PD specific, but can flex student adult and then two are adults. And then we can flex a couple of our other rooms if there's like a mass casualty situation. Um, all of our rooms are meant to be resuscitation rooms. So they all have suction. They all have, um, you know, everything you need. So, uh, you know, just because of our, our acuity is so high, we need every room to be a recess room. Um, so we have the ability to expand if needed. That was something I didn't know before I came to Bay State. I didn't know what that was like. Like I had trained at other hospitals where they had dedicated resuscitation rooms and there was like two. And that also functioned as a trauma bay. And like, I didn't know what that was like, but God, is it a luxury to have multiple rooms with doors? First of all, first of all, ask every place you work if they have doors. For your wellness, it is so nice to be able to close the door. Um, second of all, it is so nice to have all the equipment in the space that you need for resuscitation. And I didn't realize again, with the sickness that is at Bay State in Springfield, Mass, it is so important to have a lot of spaces where you can take care of people. Thank you so much. I'm sorry if this hey. was, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Paige. Um, are the second years also running or doing airways for the medical resuscitation? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't sure if it was just trauma or if that changed with medical. Thanks. No, in your pod specifically, as a second year, you will take every airway. Um, And that being said, there is no shortage of airways. You have anesthesia opportunities in your first year. It's like three or four weeks. I can't remember. Um, And then you also, four? I feel like I did 30 volts on that one. <laughs> this is supposed to be four. Um, but anyway, you're supposed to do four weeks of anesthesia. You should be able to get your required number of tubes. But again, that being said, in your time in the department, there is no shortage of intubations. You'll have plenty of airway exposure, lots of different ways you can do them too. Um, so yeah, lots of that. The first time I ever intubated someone in that hospital that wasn't on like my anesthesia rotation as a medical student was like my, I think it was my first week of residency. I got to intubate someone in the department. So people are always around. I think there's a really good, I, like no matter where you end up at residency, it's going to be really hard for you to hurt a patient unless you're lying to your colleagues because you're going to be surrounded by people all the time that perpetually know what's going on and will be there for you. Uh, but at our institution, it's blatantly obvious that we want to be there for you. And from day one, we're like, oh, did you want to get a little uncomfortable today and like intubate someone in a way that you've never done before? Or did you want to try a direct view today? Like, let's go, let's try it. Like, we're all ready to see and learn and have a good time. So you really, th this is a place where you get to do as much as you're willing to push yourself to do from day one. And we really let people kind of spread their wings. Yeah. And we also have attendings that are credentialed in like fiber optics um, and stuff like that. So that's a cool, um, you know, approach to do in the ED. Like I did a fiber optic in the trauma bay once for a burn patient. Um, so we definitely um, have a lot of different experience with regards to airways. Colton got to, you know, intubate his first week of residency in the ED. I didn't get to do one till my first week of second year because at intern year, I apparently was a white cloud and then it turned to a very black cloud. Um, so I didn't get to intubate until my second year and I have, I don't know, 80 something intubation. So like certainly uh, you get plenty of exposure and experience. Just wanted to thank you guys um, for doing this. Also, thank you for just being yourselves in the chat and talking. I think that's something that's appreciated. Um, I was just wondering if you can speak to, um, I keep hearing good things about your program from like everyone around. So like, I was just like the common issues that are facing like a lot of programs, like boarding in the emergency room, pushback for admissions, um, relationship with um, off-service providers. I was just wondering if you guys could just talk about the state of that in your hospital. I don't think there's a hospital in the country right now, much less an academic ED that doesn't have boarding and we have it. And um, some days are worse than others for sure. Um, but we just opened up this new area that's kind of essentially a fast track area. Um, and it's moving a lot of lower acuity patients away from our, our uh, high acuity pods. So right now as a three on my busy shifts, I'm seeing 
on an overnight recently when I was busy, I saw 22 adult patients and ran three traumas. Um, so there's volume and we're moving weight. And some days you move weight because no one needs to come into the hospital. Um, and other days your admission rate is 75% just because you rolled the dice and it turns out everyone had a troponin that was like 9,000 million or whatever. Uh, but as far as pushback for admissions, unless you're really trying to admit something that shouldn't be in the hospital, uh, absolutely not. Um, we have a really awesome relationship with our surgical colleagues, with our neurocardiology and inpatient medicine teams, and they know our patient population. We have an admission rate of about 50% for a reason, but it's not like that every day. You know, some, some days you send almost everybody home and some days you admit almost everybody, but when the data is there, you know, you can't, you know, there's no denying it. And the inpatient teams know that. And I've only ever gotten pushback if they were super strapped for beds and someone was borderline anyway. Like, for instance, we have a couple of really good outpatient follow-up clinics where it's like, hey, you know, this person ruled out for ACS, but should really see a cardiologist. We actually have a cardiologist that will see any patient that rules out of ACS, but is high risk within two weeks. You just got to email them. We also have outpatient TIA follow up with our neurology associates, and they'll get someone an outpatient MRI within two weeks, especially if they're high risk. So when you guys are kind of strapped for rooms or when we're strapped for rooms and there is reason to have pushback because we're strapped for rooms, there's still really good outpatient follow up too. So I, I'd say we have a great relationship with the, with the inpatient teams, and I don't think I've ever really gotten pushback for an admission. I would agree. I don't think I've ever gotten pushback on the admission itself, like whether or not this person should stay or not. It's more so like where they should go or what service maybe should admit them. That's mainly been my discrepancy in like who should take them. Like, should it be a surgical admin? Should it be an ortho admin? Is this a medicine admin? Um, that's been my point of contention. Yeah. And also since, um, yeah, Colton's right. They should never be an ortho admin. Um, but uh, we also, ha since we have three other uh, community hospitals uh, associated with Bay State, we also have shared admission process. So if we have a patient that might not need the level of care Bay State um, can provide, so they don't necessarily need, um, you know, uh, GI or cardiology, maybe they just have like a pancreatitis that needs some fluid and PO challenge and get out, um, we can we can actually send them to one of our um, other hospitals to free open a bed to, for someone that's more sick and, and might need a higher level of care. Um, so we're certainly working on trying to, you know, decrease the amount of boarding time. Obviously, it's a nationwide issue, um, but this year we've, you know, put some forth some good effort as to trying to decrease um, decrease the amount. We have a new, well, our chair is now retiring. I'm not sure who's entirely is, that's something to kind of bring up. Our chair is retiring. We're not sure who is taking his position, but we do have, it's Colton. Yeah, you're right. Um, we do have though a new, a director of operations that kind of oversees all the different hospitals. He's a, a young guy, Seth Jemmy, um, has, you know, put forth a lot of effort, really cares about this area because he grew up here um, and, you know, wants to improve the healthcare in our area. So um, he's, you know, super passionate about that. Uh, so I think, you know, we're, we're heading in, in the right direction, but obviously there's always room for improvement. Erin, I believe there were three parts to your question. So you said boarding, you said relationship uh, with off service and pushback. Okay. Yeah, and I I mean, I am friends with a lot of the off-service um, um, specialties. Uh, we just today had an EMIM conference, didactic conference. So we all got together um, to discuss like um, posterior strokes and abnormal presentations. Um, so we do try, we try to bring in other specialties to come within our conference as well to talk about their, you know, specialties. So whether that's cardiology coming in and talking about uh, transvenous pacing, um, whatever it may be, OBGYN talking about abortions and uh, health care, you know, uh, birth control access and stuff like that. So uh, we do try to um, get involved other other residencies and I'm I'm good friends with some of them. So Sam, and you spend a lot of time with them in your off service, like in your month together, like you are forming connections and, you know, networking with them. They're your colleagues and it makes it a lot easier to call them at 3 a.m. with consults. Um, 
when you know them and have worked with them before. Uh, so you'll get to know quite a few of them and it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, oh, also it is eight o'clock. If you need to step out, please. It has been an hour, we get it. If you need to go, take care of yourselves, do what you gotta do. But also feel free to stay, ask your questions, we're here. Um, so question is, is there a more graduated model um, or is it more of a free for all on the board? So yeah, so resuscitations, I would say it's more of a graduated model. Um, you have uh, the third year typically running the resuscitation, uh, the second year is doing airway, and then the intern um, will be doing like ultrasounds, procedures, stuff like that. Ultimately, if it's your patient, it's your procedure. So you could have a patient that decompensates on you and you're pretty much expected to be their provider unless you feel overwhelmed, you feel like you need assistance. We are more than welcome to help. All of our resuscitations are team models. So if you feel like your patient's decompensating and we need to call a resuscitation, then it's all hands on deck um, and, they're, and we're there to support you, whether that's, you know, maybe taking over the resuscitation if you don't feel comfortable or helping you through it. Um, so, but ultimately, you know, if it's your patient, it's your procedure. And typically like we don't, um, there's never procedures we're really fighting over, honestly. So if they're, you know, we are happy as third years to give our lumbar punctures to the interns, um, you know, our central lines, whatever it may be, we're happy to, um, hand those off. I would say, you know, the main ones are like pericardiocentesis that you don't ob obviously do often transvenous pacing, um, and like lateral canthotomies. Typically we tend to have the third years do it because they're going to be the ones heading out into the community. Um, but ultimately if it's your patient, that's your procedure. Um, also wanted to highlight that as the PGY1 in the adult side of the department, you are not minimum staffing. So you're not expected to really pick up a bunch of people, move the meat or anything like that. Like you're here to learn. Um, so in the beginning for your first, I'd say month or so, we're trying to pick ones that are fruitful for your learning that are maybe not scary. Um, but obviously if a patient, like Colleen said, like the nature of these people, like odds are they might get really sick really quick. And if they do, you have plenty of support. You usually have a two, you have a three, you have plenty of people on that can help you. Um, but again, you're not minimum staffing in your first year. So. I know we're talking a lot about base state, but in general, do you guys have, you know, questions about the whole interviewing process, anything like that? Cause obviously we want you to match where you're going to be the most happy. Um, and so we're happy to, you know, discuss anything. It doesn't even need to be about base state. If we're like not able to do like a rotation at base state, is there a way for us to be like, hey, can we like stop by for a shift and like check the place out um, or anything like that? Yeah, so I would say reach out to Adam if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, I know last year we did do second looks after interviews um, and it was after we had put in our rank list. So it literally was zero, um, you know, it had no effect on your ranking if you came to visit us or not. Um, but certainly I think, you know, if uh, you're interested, we can, I don't know about maybe doing a shift with us, but we certainly can give you tours of the department. Um, have you meet some people? Something like, yeah. I yeah. yeah, so I know, like, yeah. So I would just email Adam saying that you're interested um, in doing something and hopefully we can figure something out. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. I guess um question as far as like what the relationship is with UMass. I know like it's you know it's UMass Bay State. Um I know there's like the perch program where the medical students come. Um, but is there any other like involvement between like the Worcester campus or like do people like do you do like rotations there or electives there, or is it just kind of like on paper that's what it is? So it is um, an educational relationship for medical students, uh, mostly entirely. So I was in the PERCH program at UMass, so I did all of my rotations out here at Bay State. Um, and when you're in medical school, like you you can go to either campus or any of the three campuses. I think they have a three total campuses now. But in uh, in residency, because there are just like er every residency program, as far as I'm aware, at the main campus and then out here at Bay State is filled to the brim. 
um, with the amount of residents that they can actually have, there's not really much back and forth like there was when I was in medical school at UMass. So like kids from the main campus could come out here. And if I wanted to, I could do a rotation at the main campus, which I did a couple times. Uh, but as far as being a resident, you can work on, like if you wanted to do an elective, like as an away elective, I think it would be a pretty easy sell. Like if you said, hey, I want to go do a tox away rotation, or I want to do an away EMS rotation, because we are affiliated with them. And uh, all of our uh, um, attendings are considered like associate professors through UMass, like that relationship exists, but it's not like you're expected to drive to Worcester to do shifts. Like I haven't set foot on that campus since I graduated. But if you want to, I don't think it's, I, I don't think there would be a lot of pushback. It would just have to be for the right scenario. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think the only other time that people have gone to Worcester is um, we do, there's opportunities to do uh, anatomy lab and working on cadavers and doing kind of the um, halo procedures. Um, so I think that that's the only other kind of opportunity I've seen um, out of Worcester from us. Um, there's like a fun question, but I always ask like most programs, but like, what is the top three things you guys do together as residents, like outside of the hospital? Um, we rumble, which is a, um, is a bar right near the hospital that after our three to midnight shift, we, um, tend to frequent, um, and whether that's, you know, grabbing, we will on shift order food, like call in food. And then, so that it's ready for us when we, uh, when we get there, um, obviously we have different varying drinking levels. So people don't drink in our residency program and that is fine. People do drink and that is fine as well. So, um, so we enjoy rumbling. That's going to be my contribution. Jewel. Um, I think people do a lot of different things just because Western Mass has like a lot, especially in the fall, this is the time when Western Mass really shines. Um, the big E is out here. There's a lot of different events. Some people like to host things at their house um like to have like, not barbecue what am I trying to say like a cookout um <clears throat> I don't know it kind of like depends on what you like to do you'll find people that like things that you like like if you're a hiking kind of person if you're an outdoorsy person um some people like to ski and snowboard like those are all opportunities that people have I'm not much of an outdoorsy gal in terms of like skiing and snowboarding so like I don't do that but like if someone's having a cookout I'll show up <laughs> we have people that golf okay um... Thanks. Mm -hmm. We have like a bunch of residency uh, group chats. So there's like anywhere from like, uh, I don't even know, the bachelorette um, to a golfing, to a fantasy football, to a um, like dirty rom-com novels. Like it, the like limit is if you have an interest, you can make a group chat and I'm sure at least 10 people will join it. So, um, which I think again is a reason why, uh, we, oh yeah, we have a gambling group chat called creative cash solutions. Um, uh, Bay state is near, uh, the MGM grand, which is a casino. So we sometimes frequent there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, going to a large residency, you have 16 classmates plus a total of 48 residents. You're going to find people with similar interests. One of our residents did hit it big at the Grand. I saw it happen. We were playing blackjack and he won $900 on one hand. So like it does happen. One of the trauma surgery PAs won like $15,000 off the slot like a few months ago. I heard about that. Yeah. Dan is stacking up. I forgot to talk about that. We also yeah, have like he had, he had a kid and then went fucking gambling, which he you know like any new dad would have like not done that but he was like i gotta feel him like i'm hot tonight he goes out and just pops a cool 15k easy God. never put back we also have the mass mutual center which has some like good performances and stuff like uh tina fey and amy poehler just came through and did a stand up there um bruno mars was there there's gonna be some it tends to bring in a lot of comedians so um there's one now with like John Stewart, John Mulaney, and Dave um uh or Pete Davidson is coming. So um I mean we do 
for being a like smaller city, we do tend to get some decent entertainment here. And then Hartford is pretty close by. I would want to, I do want to mention, I don't think it was brought up um, with regards to where people live. Um, there is a pretty drastic difference um, that I would say that might be important to you might not be. Um, we have people that live in, like as north as Northampton, which is about 25 minutes north of the hospital. We have people that live in kind of that um, Springfield, uh, Chicopee, Ludlow region, which is right near the hospital. And then we have people that live 25 minutes south of the hospital, which is in Windsor. Um, so we're kind of a spread out residency with regards to where people live. So if what's important to you is like constantly being surrounded by people that you know, we might not be that residency for you. Now, granted, there's always going to be people kind of in those general locations. So you'll have people like at my apartment complex, there's at least five residents um, uh, just in our program at my complex. So there's some complexes that are more heavily uh, located with residents, but we're certainly a more spread out residency. And like, if you want to make an effort to hang out with people, like you're probably going to have to drive to places. So um, just something to kind of keep, you know, make mention, because I, I didn't think when I came in that that was the case. Um, and I do think that that's something that you guys should be aware of. Um, do residents tend to rent or buy? I would say probably more rent than buy, but there's at least like, I don't know, five, a handful of people in each class that buy a house. One of which is our wife too, who bought her house on her own. Sorry, Colton. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight that. I think historically it's been really easy to buy in Western Massachusetts, but as you guys know, the housing market is dog shit right now. Um, so like my wife and I went house hunting because one of our, uh, now fellows was like, oh man, like you definitely have to buy out here. It's so cheap. No problem. We got a real estate agent and everything and everything was marked up like crazy time. Uh, but I think that's everywhere right now. Like no matter where you go, I think it's going to be difficult to find a house that's within your level of affordability that isn't just like super marked up right now. So it's possible and it's easy enough, uh, if you temper your expectations and live in the right place. Um, it just didn't work out financially for us at the time. So we're renting like a minute up the road from the hospital, which is super chill. Right across the street from Rumble. Yeah, I live a block away from Rumble. So if you guys ever go to Rumble with us and you're a lightweight like me and you have two beers and it's too much, you can do the Rumble stumble back to 95 Newberry Street with Colton. Colton, this is going online. Now everyone's going to know your web, your house address. They already They already know where it is, dude. Chickabee's up and coming or whatever, right? Chickabee's up and coming. I didn't wear my Chickabee shirt tonight because it's currently in the dryer because I wear it too much. And uh, yeah, it's up and coming. Chickabee's all right. Rent is cheap over here. Agawam's pretty great. It's chill. Rent yeah, is cool. Nice. Yeah, Agawam's nice. I live in Windsor, which is south, like the southern portion. Um, and I pay a lot for rent, but my place is pretty nice. So mm -hmm. I... Yeah, I don't mind it. Um, and I think our salary is pretty competitive for the area. Um, I'm certainly not strapping for change and I'm paying about 1800 a month for rent. And then, so like I'm paying a pretty penny, but I, again, I'm not feeling like I'm strapped for money either. I just took a two week trip to Italy um, and was fine with regards to money. So. Colleen also didn't fund that whole trip to Italy. Yeah, I did. Daddy, right? I thought it was your sugar man. Colin, you weren't supposed to say that online. She met the hottest PA when we were on trauma surgery. And after he got oh. his DVT procedures, he's just been taking care of her. He's full of shit. I would love that. Hey, what other questions do you guys have? I thought you were going to say your program sent you all to Italy. No, but two of our ed fellows or well, one of our directors of the education fellowship and one of our ed fellows is in Greece right now for some international education fellowship and the program paid for that. So it's I don't know what they're place. learning in Greece. Blood from ed, ed. Let's go. Jules. Jules, you're probably going to go to like Kentucky. Shut up. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> nah, I'm trying to like go somewhere international. Let's go. Like Canada or what? All right anywhere that's not here not the u.s let's just get out let's stamp that passport baby 
Uh, as far as like scheduling goes, um, is it like, are you able to get all your nights like in a row? Do you feel like it's pretty reasonable? I don't know. Like, I know like some programs do like one week of days and then a week of evenings and the night. I don't know. I know there's like all this different stuff going on. I guess like, how do you guys feel scheduling has been for throughout the program? Colton, you should mute yourself right now. <laughs> Colton's in a little bit of a, a scheduling uh, mishap. He's like switching back and forth from nights. I would say that that's not the uh, majority. We do do typically. This has four... never happened to anyone else. <laughs> you can handle, but happened. you're resilient and you can handle it. I look good. Yeah, you I look good. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we typically do four nights in a row and then you have um, post uh, post day and then an off day and then go back to days typically. So you have a pretty good transition back to days. Um, typically it comes out to about, I don't know, 30 something nights total I for the year. I, I haven't counted, but it's like around that. Um with regards to our scheduling, what's nice um, is that we schedule out for the entire year. So you know your shift schedule for the entire year, which allows you to plan um, for trips. It allows you to make swaps, um, to extend some trips that you might do. Um, and then I would say the caveat to that is if you like, say, have something come up, it might be difficult to find swaps just because the schedule's already switched out. Um, but a lot of our co-residents step up for each other and, and typically we find swaps. And if it's something that like you absolutely cannot miss, um, we will then bring it to like the administration and we'll figure out, we'll figure out a plan for you. Um, you know, again, we emphasize wellness. So if it is something that's super important that you need to be at, um, we will do our best to get you there. And we get four, we have four weeks off. They're taken from Monday to Sunday, um, a year. We also then get five, extra five to six extra days off over the Christmas or New Year. So either you're getting Christmas off or you're getting New Year's off each year, which again is something nice that I didn't actually know coming in. Um, so that's that's not including those four weeks off you get. So it's you're te technically getting about five weeks, which is pretty amazing. And you have five sick days also. Yeah, and five sick days. Yeah, and five personal days. I think it I think it ends up being 10 total days off. Because when I got COVID last year and they were having us test or like not come back to work until we tested negative, I was out for 10 days. And I, I used like five sick and five personal days. So like a personal day. And and honestly, we don't push back on anything. We can know you're lying about calling out and we're not gonna push back on it. Okay. So like the idea of like personal days and sick days, they're all there for you. You can literally call us as long as you're respectful at like a reasonable time just be like look dude can't do it today i know that i'm going to come into work and i am just going to be an asshole and so i'm not doing it i'm not coming to work today um i need this because i can't i can't hack it today and we're going to be like all right cool thanks for being honest about why you're not coming to work we're gonna we're gonna figure it out no problem uh which is wild um, I mean, when you talk to places, I, I, I think the biggest takeaway is when you guys leave here and you go interview along the trail, like finding out what sign out culture is like, and then finding out what like the actual mental health culture is like, because a lot of people talk about wellness, dude, it's a buzzword. Like when we applied to medical school, like we all applied around the same time, I reckon, even those of you like coming in later, like feel like the buzzword was like, diversity and equity. And now it's wellness. Everyone wants to talk about wellness, but like very few places are going to tell you how they do it. So they're going to be like, oh, we love wellness. And you got to strategically be like, but like how much and what are you doing about it? So like on the trail, find out about what they're doing for wellness, make them prove it to you and then ask them about sign out culture. That's it. I want to jump on that. I also want to say like, uh, pay close attention to the residents when you interview other places. And like, when you do like these kind of like informal meet and greets and stuff, pay attention. Are they burnt out? Are they exhausted? Like that'll tell you a lot about how much the program values their wellness and, you know, how it's affecting them and how their years are going. Um, that was something I paid close attention to. and I'm really glad I did. It'll tell you a lot about how your program cares for you. Are there any big changes coming down the pipeline for the next few years in the program or the hospital that you guys are aware of or th things being talked about? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, I would say, like I mentioned, the chair uh, of our department who's been there for like, I don't know, he's been chair for 12 years or something like that. Um, he's leaving. So I don't know, again, what's going to happen to that. They don't technically, like, we don't work really um, side by side with them. They're mainly like working with the attendings and whatnot. But um, certainly that will be a change in whichever way that goes. Um, but I suspect just given our culture and what, like the emphasis is always on resident education. And so whoever comes into that role, like that, they are going to make sure that that it still remains the emphasis. Um, so I, I don't think that there, there'll be too much to worry about from that standpoint. Otherwise, I don't, I haven't heard any rumblings of anything major happening um, within our hospital system or within our program. The hospital CEO is retiring, but like, oh, right. I'm sure they're just going to find another old person to do it like every other hospital system. I don't know. That literally has no factor on your day-to-day -day life, though. Oh, we just built a new mental health hospital oh right? yeah forgot about that yeah. yeah i forgot about that but that's i think i think it's opening or opened it hasn't opened yet it hasn't opened yet so that's another change so i suspect um we will there's talk that like maybe not all of our psych patients will need to be medically cleared at red they can just go directly there um so that should also um help with regards to our mental health crisis in our area so um yeah i think that that's it that's major, anything major. And obviously like, you know, if you're, um, you know, towards the end and ready to rank and if Bay State's something that you're interested in, feel free to reach back out to us and ask us if there's anything else that has come up since, um, since we talked, because obviously things change frequently. Um, but yeah, I don't, um, I don't suspect anything major, at least this uh, academic year. And we get some inside scoop because we're chiefs. So like, I don't, I don't think I've heard anything. Um, what's like the relationship like with like the auxiliary staff or like the nurses and the PAs? Like, do you ever feel like it's short staff? Do you guys ever have to be the ones that place the lines? or cart the patients to CT, for example? I think we have a great relationship with the rest of the staff. Um, the only thing that is affecting our ED, but also is affecting nationwide right now, is the turnover from travel staffing. Um, we see a lot of travelers just because, again, we're a high acuity ED with no places well staffed at this point. Um, but we do our best. <laughs> uh, in terms of lines and stuff like that, our nursing staff will try their best. And if they are unsuccessful, they'll tend to come get us. Uh, and we can do an ultrasound guided line. But otherwise, we're not typically the ones doing it unless it's a really tough stick. And you know, it's going to be like a dialysis patient that really has poor access. You should probably just prepare to do it yourself. Um, but a lot of times they will try first and then you can jump on and help out. Um, and then in terms of, I don't think I've carted anyone to CT. I usually will join the squad that's wheeling them over if I'm really concerned, um, but not in terms of like bringing them over myself. Yeah. And back to the, like the IVs, like we are starting initiatives where we're teaching the nurses how to place ultrasound guided IVs as well. Um, so uh, that's been super helpful. So and a load kind of lifted off if there's a nurse in like the pod that can place um, the ultrasound guided lines. Um, so that's super helpful. I like hang, like Jules and I hang out with some of the nurses outside of, um, the hospital. Uh, we have a good time with them. Um, so yeah, I, it certainly, um, could be a lot worse than it is. And we're actually our, well, no, I guess this is recorded, so I'm going to keep it at that. Um, but yes, we have great relationships with our nurses. Same with APPs and stuff too. I don't know if that got mentioned. Uh, oh yeah. MPs, yeah like, think... We work so well with them. I mean, there was a time when there was like concerns about airway stuff just because some of them were could care credentialed and learning to intubate and want to exercise that skill. Um, but we're seeing a little bit less of that because the ones that are certified to do it have the credential to do it and they will do it if it's appropriate. Um, but again, the second year is the one who gets the priority on the airway no matter what. 
Um, yeah, it's just totally. on overnights where that got a little bit sticky. Sorry, Colton, go ahead. I said always. Okay. I was just adding. Okay. Sorry. Um, but yeah, on overnights is where it got a little bit sticky because on overnights, the second year will be with an APP. And if that APP is airway credentialed, you kind of have to have a discussion about like, is this my airway? Is this going to be yours? Um, but for the ones that are not credentialed, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but honestly, it's never been awkward. I love working with the APPs. They carry a lot of weight. They put a lot of work into the department. Um, and they're currently really spearheading the effort with this new triage model that Colleen, I think it was Colleen that mentioned it. Um, mm -hmm. The vertical, the VTA. Um, uh, so about... doing, like the lower acuity stuff and kind of helping to alleviate some of the pressure from the waiting room or decompress it. Um, the APPs are really spearheading that and working really, really, really hard to help us. So. And from like an attending standpoint, we're on first name basis with all of our attendings, unless there's like a nickname that we're calling them. Um, so which I think, again, kind of shows to our program, like we have a pretty good relationship with um, all of our attendings. Um, they're in a lot of group chats with us uh, with regards to interest stuff. Um, and like we like we'll golf outside of um outside of uh the hospital hang out outside like um there was just a concert recently and we saw you know a bunch of attendings there and they came up like they actually came up to us versus us seeking out them uh which i thought was you know a pretty pretty neat thing so um we certainly have a good time with everyone yeah including admin like colleen said like it's not even just the attendings that we work with on a daily basis like adam is included deutsch is included like we are on first name basis with all of them. And like sometimes Deutsch will even have us at our house. Like it's a very chill environment. Yeah. And those resilience clubs that we have on a monthly basis, they're always hosted by an attending. So typically we go to an attending's house, they have food, drinks for us. Um, and it's kind of a cool way to like see how people live on the other side of like attending hood. Um, you know, a CN who's now one of um, the chairs of the department has like this gorgeous backyard with this nice pool. So she, that's always the first resilience club um, is at her place. And we just hang out, uh, have a good time, talk about something with regards to wellness. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's kind of neat to have to kind of see what life is like as an attending as well. And you get to meet their families too. A lot of times their families are there. Like Adam will have like a welcome uh, in July, I think it is for the barbecue, like the welcome for the intern. Um, and his whole family's there. You'll meet his wife, his girls, like you get to meet everyone's families and that's always really nice. Yeah. Well, it's almost 8.30. I think we can, unless yeah. anybody has any burning questions, I don't want you guys to feel like you have to stay on so we yeah. can... We can certainly call it at this time if there's nothing further. I'll also drop um, my email in the chat. Um, you can also email the chief's email if you'd like, if you guys think of anything. Um, basically. So that way, if you think of things and you want to still ask them, you have an opportunity to. And then I think we all got your emails from most likely getting the link. So we can also send out our all our contact information through that as well so that you guys have it. And again, feel free to reach out to us, even if it's not about base state, it's about general applying um, interviews, whatever, we're happy to help. Um, I'm currently going through the match process in ERAS again, doing uh, sports medicine. I thought I would never have to do that again, but here we are. Um, so I, uh, you know, we're super excited that you guys are going through this process and hope you guys consider base state. We love it here and we want to share it with you. So let us know if there's anything we can do to show you. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you yeah. taking time. I know it's just like a super busy time. So very cool to hang out with you. Thank you. No burning questions and we'll end. Cool. Thanks y'all. Good luck with everything. Goodbye.